Welcome to the 2024 Conference for the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship, also known as the Fellowship of Christ. I want to welcome you, and as our opening prayer, we're just going to go right into taking the sacrament. Christine is going to read the prayers for us, and then we will move forward from there. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. We've had a number of things happening in the past year to report. The first one I want to mention is towards the end of last year, we started a meetup group. And so if we have a calendar, we still have a calendar, not sure how long we'll have a calendar, but by using meetup, we're able to very easily put things on a calendar there. And then you, if you sign up, get notifications. Now I know not everybody wants to be on meetup. So that's why we're doing the dual meetup and a calendar at the same time. And there may be some things that are on the calendar that aren't in the meetup group. And as we move forward, you know, there may be some, some differences depending on the needs of the people and the organization. But I want you to be aware that we found out about a it's kind of a it's a it's a mix of, of different Latter-day Saints to get together to discuss the Book of Mormon. One person will put on a presentation and then there'll be a QA. And, and it usually lasts about two hours on Monday nights. And it it's very good. I I've, I've been enjoying it a lot because of the fact that they seem to be very ecumenical. You know, they have people from a wide spectrum of the Latter-day Saint movement doing these presentations. We reached out and said, Hey, can we Put this on our meetup group so that more people know about it. We'd, we'd love to help get more people to come. This is right up our alley. And so if you want to know what's going on with that, you can join their mailing list or you can sign up on meetup.com and, and we will have all the information there for you. That's Monday nights. And currently on Wednesdays and Thursdays, we also have some meetings. And uh, I'm, I'm not the one who's running any of these, just so you know. And we're trying really hard to branch out time zone wise so we have a meeting on wednesdays it's a bit of a spiritual growth meeting where we get together and just discuss the the growth that we have encountered um, we have a wednesday night meeting where we are currently 
covering. It's a it's a class. We were going over the uh, looking at the visions and revelations of John, and uh, comparing it to the visions and parables of Zenus from the Plates of Brass, and we wrapped that up earlier this year, 2024, and we have started just really just started getting into um, comparing First Moses from the Plates of Brass to Genesis, both in the Old Testament and the Bible and um, the version that's in the Joseph Smith or inspired translation of the Bible, which for the uh, Salt Lake City branch, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, would be their Book of Moses. So on Thursday, a brother in England is running a prayer meeting where we get together for about 30 minutes and people that send the prayer requests, that's where we pray. So if you have a prayer request, you can send them to us on the on the website. And also, if you want to pray with us, you're welcome to do so. And, and this meeting is in the afternoon because it's the evening over in England. So we really want to get all these different time zones covered. Uh, Michael Clark, he's an evangelist over in, in England, and an apostle and evangelist. He is he's running that meeting and it's it's very spiritually uplifting i really would like to encourage you to come if you can and then thursday nights if you're familiar with what we've been doing it, it was for quite some time just a hangout people just go and just kind of hang out and chat and talk about what's going on but recently this year i think at the beginning of the year sometime in january we started talking about the declarations of noom and if, if you are familiar with noom in the book of mormon um, nephi mentions noom quotes from noom once and it has been translated from the place of brass, and it's very interesting. Noom is a prophetess who was singing and dancing in prophecy in the name of the Lord, and her declarations were written down, and we now have access to them, and we are studying them. And we want we want to do more. We want to be able to meet the needs. We we have five six hundred people slash families that have registered and want to be counted as members of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, whether that be part of the ecumenical movement or they're actually looking for a non-denominational church. That's a lot of people. I mean, compared to, what, 8 billion people it's not, but it's, it's a good number of people. We want to be able to meet your needs. And so we are looking for more people to do more things, as we always are. So with that in mind, one of the websites, it's currently under development, but it's still there for you to go and look at, is ofprofits.org, or more specifically, school.ofprofits.org. And you can come to this website, and we have, right now, currently, as of this recording, we have a class on patriarchal blessings to help you get more out of your patriarchal blessing. We have the Wednesday night meeting that I mentioned before, the two actually, uh, Mysteries of God, the beginnings, where we're going over First Moses and Genesis, and then the unfolding of the revelations of John, which goes over again, St. John from the New Testament and Zenos from the Plates of Brass. So if you want to do an independent study, these courses are there. You can look at them. If you want to be a part of the group discussion, you are welcome to join us at any time. Um, and we, we want to do more. We're planning on putting more up there. And I want to be clear that this School of Prophets, it's run by the fellowship. But if you want to do one, if you feel the Lord calling you to put together a class that's specific to your branch, the Latter-day Saint movement, this is for cross-pollination. I mean, that's what ecumenical movements do. And so a big part of this is to create a safe place for us all to go and gather and learn from one another. So the invitation is there. We are putting together a committee for the School of the Prophets. We kind of have a loose one right now, but we, we want to really get this moving forward. And so we need people to teach, to create and teach classes. We are going to be putting together a page that has a list of different volunteers that we need, but I would like to ask you to please perfectly go to the Lord and see if you're one of these called to help with what we're doing. I feel very impressed by the Spirit to put out this invitation to please come and see, 
please get involved in the work. Having five to 600 people that declare themselves members of an organization, we want to meet your needs. To do so, we need to know what those needs are and we need the people who are called to come and do the work. The Lord qualifies those who are called. We started this as a as an organization, not merely a website. In 2019, that was five years ago. I want to give a special thank you to all those who have helped in the past five years to get us where we are today. Because without you, we wouldn't be here. The Lord called you, the Lord qualified you, and it was time for you to move on. The Lord sent you to where he needed you to be next. Now we've got a group of people here that the Lord has invited and is called. And we are continuing this work forward. I want you all to know that you are loved, you are needed, and we want to hear from you. You have come and seen. I would like to invite you to come and do. So to wrap up our yearly progress report, Christine is going to share our financials. And we were not able to do this last year. We just didn't have the time to put that together. And so Christine is actually going to be going over last year's and the previous year's numbers. And I apologize. I want you to know that if you ever want to know what's going on with us financially, you are welcome to call me. I, I will talk to you about that. I'm very transparent. I will let you know where our bank statement is. I will let you know where we are spending the money. Um, I will tell you that last year, Christine and I traveled as much as we could to try to meet the saints where they are. We would like to continue doing that to the best of our ability. And I want to thank all those that have been helping us out financially. I want to thank all those that have been helping us out through time and effort and things that you've done for us. We can't do the things that we do without you. We want to be as transparent as possible and so whatever we can do to do better, please let us know. We are honestly open to suggestions. So with that, Christine. Hi, this is Christine reporting the 2022 and 2023 financial report. In 2022, our beginning balance was $868.84. We received $1,565.09 in donations, and our expenses were $1,120.51, with a remaining balance at the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023 of $1,260.35. In 2023, our donations received were $6,448.89. Our combined expenses were $3,464.29. And our ending balance in the year 2023 was $4,138.08. I want to thank Christine for taking the time to put those numbers together for us. And uh, I want you guys to know, you know, ever since COVID, things have really changed for our family. And, and this is a bit personal, but transparency. Christine was a stay-at-home mom for the majority of our marriage. And she has gone back to work. She went back to work during COVID. And so now we're, we're both working. Our children are older. They're in school. So... It works out, but she also went back to school full-time. She wants to finish up her education, and I'm fully 100% supporting her in this. And so the time that she takes to do what she does for the fellowship 
is very, very precious. And so I just wanted to take a moment to thank her for taking the time to do this and letting you guys know the sacrifices that she is making for our family and for the fellowship. I appreciate her beyond words. I, I couldn't do this and the fellowship would not be where it is without her. So thank you, Christine. From here, we have some messages from our fellow saints and the topic of this year's conference is the light of Christ. I hope that you prayerfully consider each of these messages because I do believe that the Lord has something to say to you personally through each of them. What is that? And how can you use what they have to say We're going to move forward with some messages from our fellow saints. And I want to thank them for putting these messages together. The topic for this year is the light of Christ. And I want to testify to you that the people that put these messages together, these messages are from the Lord. And there's a message for you in each of them. So I'd like for you to listen with your hearts listen as they speak to you in spirit listen in spirit and see what the lord has to say to you through them Good morning brothers and sisters all over the world and I welcome you to my abode here in Claycross, uh, Derbyshire near Chesterfield and I want to share with you today a testimony of scripture. I want to speak to you today about our scriptures about this book, the Book of Mormon, which is known in in Restoration branches and uh, also the Mormon Church, but also it is known as the Record of the Nephites in the Church of Jesus Christ with the Elijah message. And I first came across the Book of Mormon when LDS Mormons tapped at my door and shared a copy with me. I went on to become a member of that church, which led me on a journey, rather like Joseph Smith, when he went and prayed to ask God which church he would belong to, and he said none. God said none to him to start his own, which he did, and he, he restored the church on earth. And I want to talk about the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon told the 1,000-year history of the Israelites 
who were led from Jerusalem to a promised land in the Western Hemisphere. In their new home, they built a civilization, fought wars, heard the words of prophets, and received a visit from Jesus Christ in the rest in his res resurrection. So if you read the Book of Mormon, it describes that happening unto the people. So the Book of Mormon, work accepted as Holy Scripture in addition to the Bible in church, Mormon churches, uh, including the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Restoration Branches. It was first published in 1830 in Palmyra, New York, and was thereafter widely repented and translated. Its followers, followers hold that it is a divinely inspired work revealed to and translated by the founder of their religion, Joseph Smith. So in the, in the book you can... Um, we can how we got the Book of Mormon. Lehi warns the people. Lehi leaves Jerusalem. The plates of brass, travelling the wilderness. Lehi's dreams, building a ship, crossing the seas, and lots of other things that happened. Uh, ben King Benjamin's speech. Just just have a read. Um, if it's the first time, just. Read the Book of Mormon. My favourite story in the Book of Mormon is uh, is Lehi's dream. So Lehi got taken to a in his dream to a, a field, and in that field he saw a tree with some fruit on, lovely white glowing fruit. He saw a person in white there as well. He saw a rod of iron. And he saw people going towards the tree on the rod of iron. But also he saw a river and a building. And people were falling away from the rod. That's when we fall away from God. So the rod to me is our faith. And we should killing hold to that rod. And read and learn more about God and head to that goal of that tree to take that fruit. Take that fruit. So head to that tree. Keep your hand on the rod. Keep reading the scriptures. And uh, keep praying. Keep having communication with God. And uh, this can change your life. i just like to say hello to people I know, those uh, who have contact with me and, uh, and the, the, rest, the Restored Branch, uh, Matthew Gill's church. I want to thank him for how he shares the Book of Mormon and, uh, and I watch his, his uh, Sunday service. For James Patrick, James and Patrick McKay, and for Dave, David Ferriman and Brandt and Kyle and Mark, uh, who inspire me to to read the Book of Mormon, and also to read the Bible. So uh, I just want to say a pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so much. And that you give us the Book of Mormon. And uh, I pray that your spirit will be with us, that we learn to read it more. And uh, learn things of it. And I, say, and I pray that it will get into our hearts and minds and help us be compassionate to our fellow man.
Wherefore, I beseech of you, brethren, that ye should search diligently in the light of Christ, that ye may know good from evil. And if ye will lay hold upon every good thing and condemn it not, ye certainly will be a child of Christ, which is Moroni 7.18. I think a lot about the light of Christ and what that means. And I really think that it's so important for us to seek not to condemn others and seek how we can judge others by Christ, but how we can see good and evil and diligently search to become more like Christ. It's about discernment and awareness, and that's what light gives us, is the option to see things better, the the vision that Christ has to know where people are in their season in life. And just like, you know, as the planets go around the sun and our lives revolve around God, sometimes we're turning away, so we're at night. Sometimes we're in a season that we're further away from God, like in the winter. And we really do need to know that even in that darkness, even in that time that is away, or whether it's in our atmosphere or another atmosphere, you know, whether it's our storm or, um, you know, our season in life or our angle that we've angled away, there is always light available to us. And Jesus Christ asks us to remember that the sun is always there. That's why it's such a reflection in the moon at night is to say even in our darkest moments, even in the times that we don't think we can even see Christ when it's a cloudy night and you can't see much for stars or moon or when it's really foggy and dense or there's a storm or when there's less hours of daytime. Light will always be there for us and we can be a light to others as well. We can seek to be flashlights or candles or reach out. And, you know, there's a joke. It says, um, you know, a man was struggling with his faith and he decided to jump off a boat in the middle of the ocean. And he said, well, if there's really a God, God will save me. And some of the people on the boat tried to throw a life preserver. And he said, no, you know, I want God to save me. And then, you know, another boat comes by and they were trying to save him too. And he says, no, God is supposed to save me. And, um, you know, he, he started to wash up on shore And he still was like, no, I'm going to be saved from the ocean by God. And finally he dies. And, you know, he gets up to heaven and he says, you know, I'm amazed that there really is a God because I asked God to save me and he didn't. And, you know, they, they say back to him, well, we sent people to throw you a life preserver or we sent a boat and there was an island there for you. But when you're only looking to God and you're fixated on that sun, sometimes it's more than we can understand. We do not have a fullness of ability to see all that God is, but we can absolutely see the moon when we're looking for it. And Yes, there are distractions sometimes. There's storms, there's clouds, there's weather, there's angles. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because we can't see it, we still can know it's there. We can still know that light is available to us. But sometimes when we lose that light suddenly, it's that much darker. It feels that much alone. And there will always be light available to us. And we need to remember that to not only let our eyes adjust and let our lives adjust, 
but to continue to seek light so we can see better and know better and feel lighter in our lives. And then when we feel better and lighter in our lives and we have more of the spirit with us, that's like summertime. That's like when it's perfect, beautiful weather. It's warm and it fills us and it helps us to know that God loves us and God wants us to be a light for others and make their lives lighter and use our ability to understand good and evil, but not judge and condemn because that's how we become children of Christ. I leave these things with you in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, sisters, brothers, and friends. My name is Brent Larson. I'm a teacher for the School of the Prophets, and you can learn more about the School of the Prophets by visiting our website at school.ofprophets.org. Of Prophets is one word there. So I spent some time studying and pondering on the theme of the conference from Moroni chapter 7, and I wanted to share some of what I learned from that experience. As I studied this passage that I've read many times before, I found it kind of interesting to see it with this new perspective, a perspective that I would have never had if I hadn't discovered all of the recent revelations of so many new scriptures that have been flooding the earth in recent years. The topic of this conference comes from the book of Moroni, chapter 7, verse 18 or 19, depending on which version of the Book of Mormon you prefer. It reads, Wherefore, I beseech of you, brethren, that you should search diligently in the light of Christ, that you may know good from evil. And if you will lay hold upon every good thing and condemn it not, ye certainly will be a child of Christ. I started my study by identifying the most obvious questions that could be asked about what was being said. These are the questions that I came up with. What does it mean to search diligently in the light of Christ? How does searching diligently in the light of Christ enable me to know good from evil? What sorts of good things do people condemn? Like, is that even something that I should honestly be worried about? How does laying hold upon every good thing make me a child of Christ? And what insight can I gain from this passage as a whole once I understand its individual parts? So I approach each of these questions with three thought exercises. First, I thought about the question long enough to to decide what I think it means simply by reading the words and, and just thinking on them myself. Second, I searched for other passages of scripture that related to the question, uh, either that had similar phrases or that had similar themes or that just felt like they connected. And so I read those and pondered on them and thought about ways that they affected the way that this passage uh, derives its meaning. The third thing I did was that I selected one of those passages from that list for each of my questions Uh, so that I could share those with you and then kind of take you along the path that that I went down as I was reading it. Uh, I will warn you that the scriptures that I found are not answers to the questions. Like, if you read the question and then you read the scripture that I thought was the most meaningful to connect to, it's not like that second scripture will somehow answer that question. It just is related enough that it It gives you things to think about that bring new meaning to the question, if that makes sense. Um, So my first question was, what does it mean to search diligently in the light of Christ? My quick answer to that was that it means that you make good habits of reading your scriptures and praying about what you read so that you can let the light of Christ guide you toward truth, right? That's the the most obvious interpretation of that. So the scripture that I found that that brought the most meaning for me to that 
was found in Matthew chapter 2. This is actually the story of the wise men when they visited Herod. This is verses 8 through 11. Um, and he, he being Herod in this case, he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I, am, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So that brings me to my longer answer to the original question. So what does it mean to search diligently in the light of Christ? I think it means to search diligently for Christ the way that the Magi did, uh, following the star that he sends as a messenger to guide our path until the light of Christ illuminates the object of our search. In their case, the object of our search was the Christ child. So that takes me to the next question. How does searching diligently in the light of Christ enable me to know good from evil? So the short answer is that once the light of Christ helps us find answers, we can easily discern good from evil. Like this doesn't this doesn't feel like something I need to ponder, right? That that's this is a no-brainer. Uh, so the the scripture that I found that I felt relates the best to this was from the declarations of Noom. Uh, in chapter 15, verses 2 through 4. From the very beginning, Moses taught that Jehovah did divide the light from the darkness. And when mankind is given to know good from evil, or to separate the light from darkness, so it is that they can tell the presence from the adversary. And so it is that Israel too must give herself unto Jehovah that he should divide the light from the darkness, and it shall be given to us to know. So my new answer to that first question, what does it mean, or how does searching diligently in the light of Christ enable me to know good from evil? My, my new answer is that when we search in the light of Christ, we actually let Jehovah divide the light from the darkness for me. Um, I don't know that it's really a different answer than the one that I came up with that was the short answer, the quick answer, but it's a different perspective. It's no longer me doing the discerning, it's me thinking about it and allowing the Lord to do the discerning and, and help me choose. Um, so that's that one. The next question was, what sorts of good things do people condemn? Like, is this honestly something that we need to worry about? Because Moroni kind of warns us to make sure and not condemn good things. So the quick answer is maybe. I mean, obviously, I never uh, condemn good things because I don't have that problem. But I know that on every issue in today's world, like half of the people fall into the other camp on every single issue. And there's just no way that anybody is right on every single idea. And we walk around condemning the other camp for all of the opinions that we have selected as being the best, right? And since, um, and since we do that, we're probably condemning good things. And the Lord is warning us, or Moroni warns us, the Lord warns us through Moroni, that we should not be condemning good things. So I think we need to be careful. And I think that's the quick answer, is that it, we probably are condemning things that we should not be condemning. So then I went searching for scriptures that 
that kind of touch on this same idea and that use similar words and stuff. And I ran into this one from the Doctrines of Saints. Uh, this is section 125. This was a revelation that was received by David Fairman uh, on the morning of January 30th, 2021. I'm starting in verse 33. As to thy call, my fellowship, to unite my people, I say, accept all those that are that all others reject with hope, joy, and happiness. Worry not that there are those that judge others by the color of their skin, or their gender, or sexual orientation, or in any other way. For those who seek to hear my voice and heed my call must soften their hearts to these, my children. Homosexuality is neither a sin nor a confusion. It is an eternal principle, for thus did I create them, and so too are my transgender children. Therefore exclude them not, hide them not, forego them not, for these are my children. And I say unto you, bring these children unto me. Worry not what the world shall say unto thee for obeying my law and my doctrine, but be thou obedient, and thy tolerance shall be a light in the darkness. But know that this is my light, the very light of Christ, and the darkness shall comprehend it not. Therefore let my love and my light shine forth through the darkness, that these my children shall no longer be lost, but be found in me, and find a home in thee. This is my commandment to my church and my kingdom. Yea, even all my saints that wish to fellowship in my name, so may it be. Amen. So my new longer answer is that we need to be very careful about what, what and who we choose to condemn, and maybe focus a little more on the beam in our own eyes than the moat in someone else's. Um, so how does laying hold upon every good thing make me a child of Christ? The short answer is that if you cling to the good, then you will be more like Jesus. I think that's a fairly straightforward passage. But so when I did the search through the scriptures, I found in Melchizedek chapter 21. This is Melchizedek from the Plates of Brass. Uh, verses 25 and 26. And let this be thy faith. Love thy enemies. Gift of thy treasure unto those who curse thee. Do good to all they who hate thee. And pray earnestly for those who seek to take thy goods or thy life. Do this that the world might know that thou be the child of Jehovah, the Creator, even El Elyon, who reigneth over the heavens. So I guess the new long answer to this question is, um, well, the thing that I like about this particular passage is that, of course, it sounds a lot like what Christ tells us to, that by this shall men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And in that one, he says that you are my disciples. In this one, Melchizedek says that by doing those things, you are a child of Jehovah, which to me sounds an awful lot like the same thing. But this one was, was interesting to me because it talks about gifting thy treasures, which is the same thing that the Magi did after they found the Christ child. I feel like these are tied together. So that's my long answer. So then the new question becomes, what insight can I gain from this passage as a whole once I understand its individual parts? Um, so as I researched this particular question, I found this passage that might not seem like it answers the question, but I think it's it's really meaningful, and at the end, it does kind of tie in. So um, I'm going to read it from, this is from the Doctrines of Saints 53b, which is titled The Olive Leaf. Uh, in the reorganized LDS Doctrine of Covenants, this is section 85, verses 2 through 3. And in the LDS Doctrine of Covenants, it's section 88, verses 6 through 13. So... He that ascended up on high, as also he descended below all things, in that he comprehendeth all things, that he might be in all, 
and through all things the light of truth, therefore which truth shineth. This is the light of Christ, as also he is in the sun, and the light of the sun, that's S-U-N, sun. He is in the sun and the light of the sun, and the power thereof by which it was made. And also he is in the moon and is the light of the moon and the power thereof by which it was made. And also the light of the stars and the power of the, by which they were made. And the earth also and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand. And the light which now shineth, which giveth you light, is through him which enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understanding, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. The light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God, who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, and who is in the midst of all things. So how does that answer the actual question? Uh, I thought it was interesting that it ties in the light of Christ. It ties in how it um, brings us into the presence of God, which was one of the things that one of those earlier verses talked about, recognize the difference between the presence and the adversary. I felt like this touched on just enough of all of the same topics that there was a certain meaning to it. And so then I pondered on this for quite a while. And, and here's what I came to. Um, the light of Christ is the love of Christ. Right? Those are the same thing. It is the power by which the heavens and the earth are created. It is our unity with the divine and it is our unity with our fellow man. It, it is life in Christ. The Son is the creation of Jehovah, the Son, S-U-N. It receives the light of Christ. It radiates that light and warmth, and it brings us into the daylight. The moon is the creation of Jehovah. She receives the light of Christ. She reflects that light. She gives us light in the darkness. The stars are the creation of Jehovah. They receive the light of Christ. They offer us that light, and they guide us on our path as we seek the king. The earth is the creation of Jehovah. She receives the light of Christ. And she, through that light, sustains life. She feeds the hungry, she clothes the naked, and shelters the outcasts. And we are the creation of Jehovah. We receive the light of Christ. And we have the ability to do something with it. And we can use that light to care for the Lord's vineyard. So now, I'm going to go ahead and speak from Moroni's perspective and say to you in the name of Christ that if you search diligently in the light of Christ that you will know good from evil and if you lay hold upon every good thing and condemn it not certainly you will be a child of Christ um, then when you are a child of Christ you will seek to bless your fellow man that God's will might be done on earth as it is in the heavens. You might be the sort who share that light by radiating that light or by reflecting it or by sharing it in order to guide others. Or you might use that light to sustain life by feeding, clothing, nurturing, or otherwise comforting those who stand in need. And by do so doing, you will lay hold upon every good thing. Uh, so I leave those thoughts with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. David asked that I put together a talk for the April 2024 Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, a non-denominational, nonprofit charity organization. I tried to keep the length down, knowing how busy everyone is, 
but please try to stick it out to at least the last half. That's when the good stuff begins. Or you might skip ahead. And getting started, I thought it might be good to walk through a short refresher on faith and the promises of the Lord, which in short lets us know that the Lord understands the trials and difficulties we will experience in our times, but he has not left us without help. For he promised that he would pour out his spirit upon the saints in great glory. And just as promised, the Lord said that he would send forth other records or books to testify of the truthfulness of his work. These additional books will ready the saints, making their faith strong, certain, and unshakable, allowing them to pass through the trials of the last days to inherit the kingdom of God on earth. Wherefore the righteous need not fear. For thus saith the prophet, They shall be saved, even if it so be as by fire. Well, let's get started with a quick review of faith and why it's important in our times. From the Word of God, we learn that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which are true. Assurance is freedom from doubt, a belief in the certainty of things. We understand in the dead of night, at some point the sun, though unseen, will rise again, driving the shadows of darkness away. Our confidence in the sun rising, just as with the Word of God, comes from years of study, observation, and experience. For those still unsure, whose faith has not been made strong regarding the reality of the work of God, let's walk through a short bit of logic. Logic employs the power of the mind. Using the power of the mind, we can determine the existence or truthfulness of things. Logic is a rational way of thinking based on an examination of the facts. A fact is known to exist such as a person, a place, a puppy, or a feeling like peace. People who rely on the mind hold to the idea that seeing is believing. Facts can also be events which represent the actions of things, especially any significant occurrence. Events can be observed and recorded. But we can't always observe every significant event, but just as in a court of law, we can examine the testimony of witnesses, documents, and other forms of evidence. From this evidence, we determine the truthfulness or factualness of the events. The greater the evidence examined, the more likely we are to determine its truthfulness. Why is this important? It's important because, as promised, the Lord is bringing to light additional records or books to support the truthfulness of the Bible. As the Lord has promised, with diligent study, this additional information will confirm your faith, making it certain, unshakable, and without doubt. Can this be proven? Let's examine the evidence. Note, in reference to Lecture 6, Joseph Smith wrote, This lecture is so plain, and the facts set forth so self-evident that it is deemed unnecessary to form a catechism upon it. The student is therefore instructed to commit the whole to memory. The Word of God contains accounts and testimonies of thousands of eyewitnesses, along with other evidence supporting the truthfulness of the information found in the Bible. Hundreds of thousands of people saw with their own eyes the Red Sea parted by Moses when the children of Israel passed through the sea on dry ground. Others report receiving messengers from God. For instance, when Mary, the mother of God, was visited by an angel who announced the birth of Jesus Christ. Is it possible to test the accuracy of Mary's testimony? There are 34.7 million search entries reporting information on this topic alone, su suggesting that this is a well-researched subject. Even with all the evidence and research available, it is not always possible to determine the ab with absolute assurance the truthfulness of events not seen firsthand. For this reason, the Lord gave us another method to verify the truthfulness of his words. In the Book of Mormon, the prophet Alma shows how to test the truthfulness of information found in the Word of God. 
diligent study, along with the application of the principles under investigation, will produce a measurable validating event of the truthfulness of the subject under study. This method of testing produces a physical, measurable experience, the witness of the Holy Ghost. This witness, in many cases, is stronger than the eyewitness testimony of others because, like a flash of light energy on a photosensitive film, it creates a lasting impression on the body, mind, and spirit. Because of this light-captured image, the saints of God in all ages have been willing to lay down their lives as a witness of the truth rather than deny what they know to be from God. See Fox's book on martyrs for more information on this subject. It's my understanding that Joseph Smith studied this book, finding it to be a true record. In summary, we can employ the power of the mind through the examination of evidence to determine the truthfulness of things. In addition to the use of logic, we can call on the power of the Holy Ghost as a witness of the truthfulness of all things. Whichever method or methods you use to determine the truthfulness of things, now is a good time to brush up on your skills. As we prepare to, prepare to examine the additional evidence God is making available to us in our times. Many people build their knowledge of the power, goodness, and nature of God based on a study of the Bible. A collection of 66 separate books recognized by most Christians as the authoritative source for the Word of God. It's a great book. Yet God has not closed the heavens. He continues to send his messengers with the Word of God. Because of this help, many people have had the good fortune of comprehending the Book of Mormon to be an additional source of revelation from God. With this second witness, students of the Word of God benefit from such notable teachers as Nephi, Jacob, Mormon, King Benjamin, Alma, Helaman, Samuel, Moroni, and many others who add their testimony to the evidence of the truthfulness of God's Word. And this is not all. Many books in addition to the Bible and the Book of Mormon have been found to contain the Word of God. Some examples include the Book of Enoch, the Gospel of Thomas, Fistus Sophia, and many others. The benefit of the new information found in these books adds to the growing pool of knowledge available to the saints of God, expanding their horizons as they seek to examine the evidence of the existence of the Lord. We live in the fullness of times, when knowledge shall be increased. But thou, O Daniel, set up, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end, when many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. True to his promise, the Lord has brought forth additional records as evidence of the truthfulness of the Bible. By studying these additional records, the saints of God will have the proof they need to make their testimonies certain, convincing them without doubt of the truthfulness of the works of God. With this new knowledge, the saints can be filled with the wisdom of God, preparing them for the great end-time drama unfolding before us. The Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship is compiling a library of the other books or a collection of, inspire, of the inspired words of God as it comes forward in our times. These records make available to the saints of God additional evidence for examination. They establish the truthfulness of the Bible, making it possible to know of the existence of God with certainty, having obtained a perfect knowledge of Him. It is a gift from God for those who seek to know of His mysteries. Noom, the oracle, is perhaps among the most important records revealed in our times. Noom, the prophetess, not only saw our day, she recorded the events in some of the clearest description available. Not only did she tell us of what to expect in the latter days, she tells us what to do about it. This book is a gift from God. This record reveals to the, saint, the, reveals to the saints the path to safety. Those who have ears to hear and eyes to see will know what to do, and they will know where to turn for help when the time of necessity arrives. 
and also to them hath he shown all things, and they have written them, and they are sealed up to come forth in their purity, according to the truth which is in the Lamb, in the own due time of the Lord, unto the house of Israel. Numa has seen great, a great vision. She is willing to share what she has learned, if we are wise. Noom uses complex literary methods to encode her message. Chapter 1 contains a chiasm, a literary technique of repetitive symmetry designed to create insight and resonance through both comparison and contrast. When all its major pieces are connected, then necessarily they will all be of one whole. They will come together even in, this, uh, even in their variation to create a unified big picture. Noom warns that we must dig deep if we are to know the mysteries of God. Time to dust off those old scriptures and get to work. And all those who would, would cut, off, cut through and dig out the knowledge and all those who would hold fast to these mysteries and these wonders that by the strength of El Elyon you might break the chains of death and hell, seeing past those who do walk in naivety. When the Americas were first colonized, the newcomers found in places well-developed, advanced tribal nations. Some of these nations retained the cherished teachings of Jesus Christ. These tribes carried, cared for the elderly and widows making certain there were no poor and no hungry among them. They loved the land, working in harmony with nature. Their prophets saw our day, warning that the pride and greed of our civilization would nearly destroy the earth. This record contains perhaps some of the best sources of practical information for those searching to understand the conditions of our times and how to unravel the many challenges we face as individuals, families, and nations. The Nemenha wrote an account of their history for our benefit, hoping that some, by adopting their, adopting their methods, might return to the ways of the peacemaker, a must-read companion to the Book of Mormon. Thank you, Chief Cloudpiler, for your work in the translation of these records. It was Moroni who stood with his father Mormon at that last great battle of the Nephites. He is the one who buried the plates containing the sacred records to be preserved by the hand of the Lord to come forth in the latter days. Moroni taught the prophet Joseph Smith. He was identified as the angel flying through the mist of heaven. And it came to pass that I saw the angel Moroni flying in the mist of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. For these reasons, it's a good idea to pay attention whenever we receive more light and instruction from Moroni, who stands in the very presence of the Lord. This record will challenge even the best of us and is best suited for the most experienced gospel students. In them you will find the path to exaltation and how to escape the judgments of God to be poured out upon the earth. You will learn how to be instructed by heavenly messengers, and you will also learn the truth about the mark of the beast, what it is and who has taken it. It might shock you as you discover the truth of these things. The visions of Zenith is another record God has revealed to assist the saints in the latter days as they prepare for the final end time drama ushering in the 1,000 years of peace. A truly remarkable record. Zenith has been shown the same heavenly vision seen by John and Nephi. Zenith sees the vision approximately 600 years before John, which introduces interesting and useful contrasts between the two records. For instance, the timing of the appearance of the seven heads recorded in chapter, Revelation chapter 13. There are many other new insights to be gathered by comparing Zenith to John's revelation. For example, the meaning of the seven flames before the throne of God is made perfectly clear. 
the organization of God's work into seven dispensations, distinct dispensations, with a unique challenge to each, it now becomes apparent. The work of the devil and his accomplices is spelled out in greater detail. The timing and distribution of events described by John is placed in a new light, and many other details which will be of great interest to those who have taken the challenge to read and comprehend John's essential work. For blessed are they who read, and they who hear and understand the words of this prophecy. By studying the Revelation, especially with the help of Zenith, it is possible to know the plan of God taking place in our times. With the game, this game plan in mind, the events and conditions of our gay begin to fall into place like a giant jigsaw puzzle, giving the saints the wisdom needed to weather the coming storms. As part of the second dispensation, Zenith des describes in greater detail Enoch and the city of Zion. The citizens of Zion reveal the key of the gates of understanding, which leads to the wisdom and knowledge, opening the way to, the, to victory in the kingdom of God. These keys can be put into practice now in our day, making it possible for the saints to prepare for the restoration of Zion on earth. You may want to get this information under your belt. From Zenus, we also learn of the organization and importance of knowledge generally, which helps us to better appreciate the unimaginable knowledge and intelligence of our heavenly parents who wish to bless us with all that we are willing to achieve. Knowledge of the truth deepens our perspective and expands the horizon of our infinite possibilities. For those who can make time beyond the study of the Word of God, there is a vast library of the great books. Have you read Cyrus the Great, the one who liberated the Jews preparing the way for the building of the second temple? It's inspiring. Or how about the life of Geronimo, who overcoming the suffering and loss of his times comes to accept the Christian faith, leaving a message of hope for all of us? How about putting down that cell phone, creating time to study the masters, and in doing so, becoming more prepared to carry on an intelligent conversation with the citizens of Zion upon their return to earth. To know good from evil, God has given us the tools and the evidence we need to know with a perfect knowledge the truthfulness of all things. With the tools to detect truth and evil, we are better prepared to consistently choose the good, thereby inheriting everlasting joy in the kingdom of God. As you grow in the wisdom of God, your faith becomes unshakable. You are now prepared to assist the Lord as he carries out the closing scenes of the great latter-day work. We might ask ourselves, have we put on the armor of God? Do we feel the Lord's guiding hand in all our decisions? Are we receiving counsel from the Spirit of God as to what to do in various situations which lie ahead? Are we taking time to listen to the still small voice, recognizing its sound in relation to the other voices heard so loudly around us? Are we rooting out the weeds of evil, replacing them with the virtues of godliness? Have we locked our doors to the vile enticements, closing our eyes to the, and ears to the devilish entertainment taking place all around us? Newham, our friend, makes this very clear. To know the mysteries of God, you must become wise in the understanding of the Lord. With diligent study, the saints can unseal the vision uncovering that which is to come. Then, you will have the wisdom of God, which is to know good from evil, light from darkness. With this knowledge, the saints will avoid the deceptions of our times. Of course, there is homework. Here we might recall the parable of the wise and foolish versions. And then, at that day, before the Son of Man comes, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, who took up their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their lamps and their, ve their vessels with their lamps. For, information, for more information about these records, or to learn how to join one of the study groups, or more, learn how to more, learn more about the record of the Menhas, or study groups working on the book of Revelation, please contact the fellowship. The fellowship is hosting study groups to assist with the study of these new records. More in information can be found at their website. We could use some strong scriptural people to help especially with some of these records. All things in one. The Lord has opened the way to increase our wisdom and, and prudence. He is making known his mysteries, preparing the saints to assist with building up the millennial kingdom of God on earth. Are you ready? The time soon approaches. Where will you be? In the arms of desperation or in the arms of comfort and peace? Come unto the Lord while he may be found. Draw near to him and feel his assur assurance. Call upon his name and he will deliver. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank all those that took the time to put together a message for this conference this year. And I also want to issue a special thank you to those that wanted to share a message, but were not able to. We had a number of saints that were willing to share messages, but I ran out of time putting all this together. And so I want to invite anyone that had a message for conference this year. We're doing a Sabbath service every Sunday. It's led by Brother Michael Clark over in England. So if you have a message to share, please don't think it just has to be shared in conference. If the Lord's speaking through you, reach out, get us that message. We would love to use it. Pass it on to the, your fellow saints through our Sabbath worship services. That was the one thing I forgot to mention in the, in the uh, it's not on the calendar, but we, we do have a, a worship service every Sunday. We put it up on YouTube and we have it on the website, thechurchwebsite.org. So as we conclude this conference, I want to thank all of you for watching this video. I want to thank you all for your support and fellowship whether it's been spiritually, financially, or in any other way. And I'd like to ask you to continue pressing forward in Christ as we move into this next year. I'm excited to see what the Lord has in store for us next. I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Elohim Shaddai, God, our eternal Father, Shekinah, our Holy Mother, Jesus, Son, Lord, and Savior, we bow our heads at this time to speak to you, to come to you in prayer to thank you for all the blessings that you have given us as a people over this past year, to thank you for the technology that we have so that these conferences can be made available to, to the whole world. This work is done in the name of Jesus Christ and it is done for your glory not for ours so we ask that you please help us to be humble as we move forward in faith to present us with all the things that 
we need to accomplish your goals and to meet the needs of the saints. Help us to be your unifying voice. Help us to help others to see the good in one another so that we can love our neighbors a little more. So we can love one another a little more. Help us to be there to weep with those who are weeping, mourn with those who mourn, and to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, to celebrate with those who are celebrating. Help us to be a people. Help us to meet together, not merely online, but offline in the real world. We ask that you place a special blessing on the Temple Committee that is starting today. Help them to meet the goals that you have asked us to meet, to be a prophetic people, to have a space, a sacred space in our homes, to build a traveling tabernacle so that we can bring the house of the Lord to where your people are, and so that we can reach that point to where we are able to build temples to feed those that need to be fed spiritually and temporally so that we can be the light of Christ and bring that light of Christ to the world. We are so thankful for all the things that you have done for us, all the things that you have given us. We ask that you Help us to learn to love one another, not merely in spite of our differences, but because of them, that we may learn of you to a greater extent by accepting our differences and learning in them and learning from them. We are so thankful for the opportunities that you presented us with. We are so thankful for all of the things that you have blessed us with. And we ask you to please help us to take the things that you have blessed us with and use them to bless the lives of others so that we can be perpetually moving your gospel forward. And helping all unify In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. These things we say and these things we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen.